Welcome to the Monday, January 30th, 2012 edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. Now, coming up, Alex Jones has an extended interview with Nomi Prinz. That's the financial expert from Wall Street and whistleblower. And they're going to get into all aspects of the financial crisis. We've also got an in-depth report on Bill Gates' ties to the media and their collusion coming up. But first, other news. Obama met with George H.W. Bush and son Jeb Bush at the White House Friday. Unbeknownst to the press, President Obama met Friday evening with the former president and his son, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, in the Oval Office. Jeb, of course, the one they tell us will be the third Bush president in that string of dynasties. But really what we're looking at here is both sides of what we were told was the World Wrestling Federation, the left and the right, meeting together. They're basically the same on most issues. They're both uh, reportedly CIA families uh, and a whole lot more. So there you have it, really. And, and Jeb Bush refused to endorse any uh, Republicans and they're gonna let them fight it out. Kind of interesting as well. Meanwhile, Ron Paul wins the straw poll in Tennessee, but it didn't make the news. Go figure, big surprise. And they've got people complaining in the media that they showed up to vote, but their vote was only for the straw poll, and that was just supposed to be an audience grabber. Meanwhile, the actual group who uh, conducted it, the Tennessee Republican Assembly, had a separate vote for who to endorse, and that was Rick Santorum, uh, who garnered all the press coverage and a whole lot more. And, uh, that's just what you get all through this race, all through the 2008 race, a media conspiracy against Ron Paul. How many times does it has to be proved? And some weirdo, Rick Santorum, is the one they give coverage to. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, the media is well aware there's a huge groundswell of support, grassroots supporters for Ron Paul, and yet uh, that somehow has no value. No matter how many straw polls he wins, no matter what place he comes in and these votes. Meanwhile, former Federal Reserve boss Herman Cain is putting his weight behind Newt Gingrich, trying to draw in Tea Party supporters to go for the Gingrich. I guess a couple, uh, one womanizer endorses another. Uh, one had to drop out of the race for his scandal. Somehow, when Gingrich's ex-wife goes on and makes all manner of accusations, though, it only bolsters him in South Carolina? Does that make any sense to you? I don't know, but the Re Republican hijack Tea Party, insert trademark here, is still referred to as libertarian, even though it shields for a former Federal Reserve boss and now a globalist stooge named ne Newt Gingrich. In late 2010, as establishment insiders continued their transformation, transformative voodoo on the movement, 87% of Tea Party organizers said they were dissatisfied with mainstream Republican Party leaders like Gingrich, who's pledged fealty to the neocon wing of the party while supporting carbon tax taxes and much of the rest of the globalist agenda, yet they're going to get the anti-government Tea Partiers to rally around just such a candidate. Yet a third aircraft is coming to the Iran area. Uh, U.S. Navy is deploying a third aircraft carrier to the Persian Gulf and really just continuing to saber for war. They're beating the drums of war, as Henry Kissinger said. And if you can't hear it, I agree, you're deaf because their propaganda on this thing is just over the top. Zero Hedge has the report uh, of how yet another aircraft carrier may provocateurs into the war with Iran that we all know could be coming and we hope isn't. There's an interesting clip speculating on the USS Enterprise because it's been decommissioned, it's on its last run, it's uh, out in the area, and could it be used for a false flag? You know, when the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor happened, all the new ships were removed from the area, and uh, FDR and his advisors, all those skull and bones people skulking around, they put in the old carrier uh, and other old vehicles to take the hit. And there's the whole history with the USS Liberty being attacked, Israel's role in provocateuring that, trying to blame it on Egypt, uh, stoke a wider war there. You've got the whole deception with the Gulf of Tonkin and a whole lot more. Let's play that clip now. With the collapse of the oil embargo to force Iran into a confrontation over the Straits of Hormuz, the US and Israel are looking for another way to get the long sought war with Iran started. And more to the point, need to make it look like Iran is starting hostilities in order to make it politically and more difficult for Russia and China to support Iran. Now, recall that Israel has a past history of attacking US warships and framing others to trick the US into attacks on Israel's enemies, with the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty, initially blamed on Egypt, as the most well-known example. 
So here we have the USS Enterprise, the oldest carrier in the fleet on her last legs, scheduled to be decommissioned next year. Her name is well known in part because of the Star Trek TV series. Decommissioning a nuclear aircraft carrier is a very expensive process. You and that's a great clip speculating on what type of false flag they might use to start another war. We know they are looking at those options because we have the Brookings Institute policy paper, Which Path to Persia, where they discuss everything from another velvet revolution to a staged false flag attack to sanctions uh, to airstrikes and, and a whole lot more. So um, that really is the real question. How will they start the war with Iran and when? Meanwhile, New Jersey Assembly aims to ban all handgun ammo and some rifle ammo. That's a story I wrote over the weekend after Alex tipped me off to Ammo Land's reports and the NRA's reports. The language seemingly targets the already prohibited armor-piercing ammunition, but would encompass any ammo that is deemed to, quote, pose a threat to the safety and well-being of law enforcement. Ammo Land is reporting that the common hunting target and self-defense ammunition would be subject to ban, along with BBs, air gun pellets, and non-metallic ammunition like plastic airsoft pellets. And it is an end run around the Constitution. Uh, you know, New Jersey is uh, de facto in the metro area of New York City, and you've got those big city areas, New York, Chicago, and others, who are in essence a constitution free to zone uh, by default because of their gun bans in that area. You've got a prominent New Jersey mayor for Newark, uh, that's Cory Booker, and uh, he's been offering the rewards for illegal guns, $1,000 cash rewards. He's part of the nationwide Mayors Against Gun Coalition, Mayors Against Illegal Guns Coalition, I believe it's called. Yeah, and um, you've got all kinds of other things going on to try to demonize guns and restrict gun-related, firearm-related things when they cannot get an all-out gun ban. There's even renewed support as Gabrielle Giffords is stepping down a year or so after her attempted assassination to now pass those bans that Congresswoman Carolyn McCarthy wanted on high-caliber high ammunition clips. Uh, you've got the Brady Center meeting with President Obama where he vowed to uh, sneak attack the Second Amendment, go after it, quote, under the radar. Uh, was that involved with the whole Fast and Furious thing? We don't know, but just crazy attempts to outlaw <coughs> ammunition there in New Jersey. And you see that back in 2008, a sister committee in New Jersey, the law... Um, the Judiciary Committee also tried to pass a sweeping gun legislation ban. It came out of committee. I don't believe it's passed into law. Now, also at the federal level, you've got drive-by scanning. Officials expand use and dose of radiation for security screening. U.S. law enforcement agencies are exposing people to radiation in more settings and in increasing doses to screen for explosive weapons and drugs. In addition to the controversial airport scanners now deployed for routine screening, various X-ray devices have proliferated at the border, border, in prisons, and on the streets of New York. Now, we've reported on all this, but they're saying this is now even pushing the uh, boundaries of acceptable X-raying because of all the covert X-raying going on. Why are they doing it? We know it's dangerous. They've done the studies. And that is exactly why Senator Susan Collins, who's on the Homeland Security Committee, is introducing a bill that would require a new health study of the X-ray body scanners. Uh, now, I don't know if that's political uh, tooling around because they promise studies and then refuse to do them and then, you know, not really fulfill their obligations on studying them. And it's a real danger to the workers. And they've had a study as old as 1998 showing that the kind of radiating machines they use at airports could be causing up to 100 deaths per year. Uh, you've got that uh, airport workers union in Boston where a lot of people came down with cancer and uh, of course it's going to be affecting people but still they insist it's there for our safety. Uh, the TSA has never caught one terrorist. Uh, they may have stood down while various other government agencies helped get patties and other false flag elements onto the planes but they never stopped anyone. But it just keeps expanding doesn't it? Now, I wanted to get into the whole Bill Gates report, but that's part of the larger eugenics paradigm. I've studied it in depth. I did another article over the weekend from The Onion, uh, the humor paper that's so funny you'll laugh 
you'll cry and now you'll die because they say in this satirical article that at least two billion people must die to save the planet. And uh, the, you know, that of course mirrors directly the talking points of the top eugenicists and the top globalists. Uh, just some of the quotes from there saying there's no way around it at this point. A coalition of scientists announced Thursday that one third of the world population must die to prevent wide, wide scale depletion of the planet's resources and humankind needs to figure out immediately how it wants to go out about killing off more than two billion members of the species. That's in the Onion article. Scientists look one third of the human race has to die for civilization to be sustainable. So how do we want to do it? And it's all supposed to be funny and desensitize you to the real agendas going on that you may or may not have heard about in the alternative press. And, you know, you can see it in the article, too, if you know what you're looking for. They say in one part that there's no avoiding the reality that half the world's progeny will have to be sterilized. That's the humor from the Onion article. Uh, you know, that parallels stuff like Dr. Eric Pianca's speech where he said, according to the transcript in 2006, we need to sterilize everybody on the earth, the audience reportedly laughed, and make the antidote freely available to anyone who's willing to work for it. He even talks about estrogen, uh, plastic mimickers, plastic est estrogen mimickers. Uh, they also talk about in the Onion article, poisoning the world's water supply. Uh, you know, that thing John P. Holdren, the White House science advisor, wrote about in the 70s with the other eugenicist, Paul Ehrlich, where they talked about putting sterile in the water. There's also the Planned Parenthood secret memo where the vice president said, among other means to bring down the fertility, they should put a st uh, sterilant in the drinking water. And there's just so much more going on, and they make it trendy and funny seeming that, quote, a ton of Africans have to die, and that, quote, all of India will have to be wiped out. Well, it's not funny. It's about as funny as. Nazis uh, shooting Jews at the edge of the pit. Why don't the Onion do jokes on that? Uh, you know, it really just is an overall uh, sidetrack thing from the real stuff going on. And you see that with the whole deal with Bill Gates. Bill Gates, of course, uh, you've seen him in the clips saying that we need to bring down the population and vaccines are going to help us do it. In fact, I think we have that clip now. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Now uh, that's back from high school algebra, but let's, let's take a look. Uh, first we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. And you notice the audience laughing there, too, how funny it is to use vaccines to lower the population, uh, all this carbon tax nonsense about global warming. Now, Bill Gates is not just the genius inventor who came up with Microsoft or the personal computer. His father uh, worked with Planned Parenthood since the 50s. They're a very wealthy family, multi-generational dynasty. They're part of the eugenics overall scheme, as are many of the computer companies. Both the Hewlett and Packard component of Hewlett Packard both have foundations that donate heavily to eugenics. The Rockefeller Foundation obviously heavily involved. And here you see a nexus of Bill Gates and Rockefeller involved with the GAVI, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. They're pushing that worldwide. They're both involved in AGRA. Uh, if we could pull that back up there. They're both involved in AGRA. Uh, that is the Growing Africa's Agriculture Alliance, where essentially they're pushing GMOs and otherwise consolidating ownership of food crops. Bill Gates, uh, we just covered how he's bought more than 500,000 shares in Monsanto more than a year and a half ago and really has a say in what that company does, all the things Monsanto is doing around the world, especially in the third world, how they're taking over agriculture here in the United States. Uh, you've got also the Rockefeller Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, both with stocks in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, the so-called Doomsday Seed Vault, while they're pushing these destructive Monsanto Terminator seeds and everything else. And then you've got Bill Gates even owning a share in Cargill, one of the biggest big agro companies, big agriculture around the world. And the Rockefeller Foundation also works with uh, Cargill on stuff like the Global Initiative for Food Systems. So you've got all these super big players um, increasingly controlling the world's food production. And here it is in the New York Times. 
uh, buried on the third page, the struggle for daily bread. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are now the world's principal private funder of agriculture research. And they not only advise on food policy, but increasingly fund it. You've also got the London Guardian, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation investments in Monsanto and Cargill have come under heavy criticism. But why don't we hear more about why GMOs are dangerous, why they're killing people, why they're destroying agriculture systems in India and Africa? Is there a media conspiracy going on? That's something we wanted to explore here because uh, you've got Bill Gates with a relationship with ABC News. It's reported in the Huffington Post, Bill and Melinda Gates sponsoring ABC News health coverage. It's also reported in the New York Times, the Gates Foundation backs the ABC News project. The Gates Foundation supplying 1.5 million and ABC's matching 4.5 million to travel the world and report on various health crises and suggest solutions, no doubt suggested in turn from the Gates Foundation and their worldwide medical complex. Now they say, of course, there's no conflict of interest and they're only paying for, you know, things like dinners and organizations and plane trips. But it really is influence. I mean, why do lobbyists take out politicians to dinner? I think we know the reason why. And uh, so you've got stuff that we recovered on Friday, like the ABC News article, Bill Gates using his money to save lives, fixing U.S. schools, reflecting on Steve Jobs. And it gets all into how he's going to save Africa and how you should be concerned about Africans and how their lives are so valuable. And that's why he's going to fund GMO crops for Africa, essentially forcing on them. And then buried at the very bottom of the article is the disclosure that the Bill and Gates Foundation supported in part ABC's news initiative, Be the Change, Save a Life. Now, it's good that they disclose that at all, but really they've got most of their viewers in the dark on the relationship there. You've got other stuff like this very article uh, where it discloses and criticizes the Gate Foundation for owning Monsanto shares, and it's sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so this article here illustrates the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's uh, criticism and their ties to Monsanto and Cargill. At the same time, the story is sponsored by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as is this entire London Guardian blog. They have two different blogs they sponsor, the Global Development blog and the Poverty Matters blog. And uh, while they talk about things like the the fact that food prices are going up and that there's food comp, uh, crises compromising the fight against world hunger, and they disclose the fact that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are sponsoring these stories. The stories themselves do not get into the substance behind the fact, uh, uh, the facts of the way that mechanism works with the world's food industry. It's severe and significant and has very deep stuff. Even where they criticize them, they don't necessarily get into all the meat and potatoes. And by sponsoring the blog, they kind of have an editorial control, even though, of course, they tell us that you know, it doesn't affect the editorial control and it doesn't really matter that they're funding their blog with millions of dollars each year. But it's not just the London Guardian and ABC News. It's many, many, many other organizations. And I have another graphic here of the media related grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as reported by the Seattle Times uh, last year. There's at least 45 here. Many of them have multiple grants. Some of the big ones include BBC World News, All Africa, Columbia University, Johns Hopkins, uh, National Public Radio, NPR is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They have various uh, medical paper writing organizations, lots of academic stuff, several organizations where they train members of the press and lead the press foundations, other universities, the Aspen Institute, the World Health Organization, all of these these are just grants they've given on media related stuff and the ABC and London Guardian is not even on this list so we know there's going to be others that aren't here. Uh, just to highlight the example of All Africa and BBC, All Africa is a pretty big website. I think it's probably the biggest consortium English language website covering African news and you tell me are they critical of what the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Agra uh, Alliance are doing in Africa to the farmers through this GMO partnership. Now, what does it mean when Bill Gates owns weather control companies, a share in the seed vault, and then pushes these uh, known, knowingly dangerous GMOs on the world?
Now, I wanted to go to a clip here where Bill Gates is criticizing Dr. Andrew Wakefield. We talked about a few weeks ago how he is now suing the journalist Brian Deere and the British Medical Journal for uh, basically slandering him over his research study investigating the autism of vaccine link. And of course, he doesn't actually say there is a link there. He's just investigating it. And of course, it should be investigated. We shouldn't stop investigating it, regardless of this one study shows. But let's go to the clip now where Bill Gates trashes him and says he has, uh, you know, a conflict of interest. There's been a lot of scrutiny of vaccines recently, specifically childhood vaccines. There's been a lot of news about, is there a connection with autism, for example? What, what do you make of all that? Dr. Wakefield wrote a paper about this saying that he thought there was a connection. What are your thoughts? Well, Dr. Wakefield uh, has been shown, used absolutely fraudulent data. He had a financial interest in some lawsuits. He created a fa fake paper. The journal allowed it to run. All the other studies were done, showed no connection whatsoever. So uh, Bill Gates accuses Dr. Wakefield of using fraudulent data and of having financial interest in the study, but Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation fund people who write medical studies. Uh, they fund all kinds of things. They're the ones with the financial interest. Uh, does he even know the term conflict of interest and how much his foundation is involved in? It's the number one eugenics funding foundation in the entire world, and there's more than 100 foundations involved in various eugenics related programs. Now, meanwhile, uh, the journalist who uh, Dr. Wakefield is suing, who smeared his name, has ties to the British Medical Journal. And uh, the autism, the Age of Autism blog says, should science betrayed BBC producer have disclosed his conflict of interest? They recycled the allegations of Brian Deere in the British Medical Journal against Andrew Wakefield, and one of the producers of the show, and uh, Alexandra Feacham, is the daughter of the leading professional beneficiary of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Sir Richard Feacham. Sir Richard, in a letter to the British Medical Journal in 2009, in which he argued for public-private partnerships and global health and disclosed his relationship. And then they quote from the clip where uh, Bill Gates says it is Wakefield with the conflict of interest. In another blog uh, that is related to the age of autism, the Office of Medical and Scientific Justice, uh, they point out how Brian Deere spoke at a French pharmaceutical conference just after attacking Wakefield. This week, journalists Brian Deere has been enjoying celebrity status at the luxury villa of Les Penisseries of the Foundation Meru on the banks of Lake Agency in the French Alps. All three MMR vaccine manufacturers were in attendance um, who were involved in litigation, GSK, Merck, and Sanofi, and the Bill and Melinda Gates was there. And Brian Deere was the uh, you know, the keynote speaker and, and otherwise was at the conference. So far, Deer has disclosed no pharmaceutical fun sponsorship or hospitality ties in his series of British Medical Journal articles attacking Andrew Wakefield. So that's another thing to look at with the whole Wakefield scandal and who really has the conflict of interest. You judge for yourself. I'm not going to be the one to tell you. Meanwhile, you've got FDA staffers suing the agency over surveillance of personal email. Now, it alleges that in this article from the Washington Post that several uh, employees of the Food and Drug Administration had tried to warn Congress the agency was approving medical devices they believed posed unacceptable risk to patients government documents show. What did this lead to? Information garnered this way eventually contributed to the harassment or dismissal of all six FDA employees, the suit alleges. All had worked in the office responsible for reviewing devices for cancer screening and purposes. That is after they surveilled their personal emails, memos, and other information. And that's what happens when you try to warn about dangerous devices inside the FDA. They go after the employees who want to warn people. Mm, very interesting. Now, Furthermore, on the GMO subject, you've got people in India trying to sue and stop the GMO thing from happening. There's been all the studies showing the cancer links, the links to sterility, the organ failure. It's also ruining the agricultural business and really putting farmers around the world uh, in a straitjacket mentality. And it's very terrible for those people. Let's play that clip now. Leo Saldana filed a complaint that has led to India charging American agricultural giant Monsanto with biopiracy. 
and the eggplant, or brinjal, is what the company is accused of stealing. Leo says Monsanto illegally used indigenous brinjal varieties to create a genetically modified version of the vegetable. So there are six varieties taken from Karnataka, which Monsanto has taken without any conformance with the Biological Diversity Act, and therefore it is biopiracy. And once they put the BT gene into brinjal, then it becomes a commodity which is essentially owned by Monsanto. Now, uh, you see there again the problems that Monsanto is causing around the world. Bill Gates has the shares in it. Because Bill Gates decided to attack um, at least what appears to me on the surface to be an honest researcher who was trying to just warn parents that vaccines could have a link with autism and that further research should be done and that Bill Gates says he's the one saving lives and that vaccines and GMOs around the world are the answer to that. Well, we're going to give him the Skeksy Award tonight just for that uh, media conflict of interest and the whole deal. I mean, really more focus should be put on this man right here. Do your own research. I'm not telling you exactly what's going on here. I'm telling you as much as I know, and I'm telling you it deserves further research, but certainly a dark cretin award for you. Now, we have a quote of the day, and then Alex's extended interview with Nomi Prince is coming up on the other side of the break. A government big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. And that's Barry Goldwater. And he also warned about the Trilateral Commission and, and the whole globalist agenda. So check out his work as well. Stay tuned. With the collapse of the oil embargo to force Iran into a confrontation over the Straits of Hormuz, the U.S. and Israel are looking for another way to get the long-sought war with Iran started, and more to the point, need to make it look like Iran is starting hostilities in order to make it politically and more difficult for Russia and China to support Iran. Now, recall that Israel has a past history of attacking U.S. warships and framing others to trick the U.S. into attacks on Israel's enemies, with the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty, initially blamed on Egypt, as the most well-known example. So here we have the USS Enterprise, the oldest carrier in the fleet, on her last legs, scheduled to be decommissioned next year. Her name is well known in part because of the Star Trek TV series. Decommissioning a nuclear aircraft carrier is a very expensive process. USS Enterprise is powered by eight nuclear reactors, all of which must be disposed of as nuclear waste material along with all the associated machinery. The U.S. Navy would save a great deal of money, more than the scrap worth of the steel, if USS Enterprise were to be sunk in the Persian Gulf, where the radioactive mess is someone else's problem to deal with. So why send an ancient warship at the end of a useful life into harm's way? The same reason Franklin Roosevelt moved a bunch of obsolete warships from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, while the newer carriers and warships were well away from Hawaii on December the 7th, 1941. Israel has three Dolphin submarines, given to her by Germany. They have been seen transiting the Suez Canal in the past and could well be operating in the Gulf of Oman, even the Persian Gulf by now, lying in wait for a used up and obsolete warship, more useful as a sacrificial lamb and an actual weapon, a ship with American sailors to be attacked as Israel attacked the USS Liberty then to be blamed on the designated target, Iran, by a compliant media. If you agree with this analysis, please post this video everywhere you see this carrier story. If we can make them doubt a false flag will be believed, maybe they'll call it off. Yeah, I'm signing these evil 1770 six flags. Doesn't get any more. Out of control than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's pretty un-American what we're doing here at InfoWars.com. I mean, not only are we promoting liberty, but we're selling 1776 flags. Now that is Al Qaeda.
Welcome back. It is Monday, January 30th, 2012, and I'm doing the interview section of InfoWars Nightly News tonight. I want to thank Aaron Dykes for the great job he did preceding me here this evening. And uh, continuing with financial news, then we're going to our financial news expert, uh, Nomi Prinz. Here's the New York Post. The Associated Press is also reporting this. MF Global Client Money Feared Gone. We've been hearing for two months that, well, they're going to find it. Of course, we know where it went, J.P. Morgan and others uh, over in London. Uh, but now, after stringing folks along, they're saying, well, now it's just feared gone. And, of course, Corazon a month ago got caught lying in Congress uh, saying that he didn't know uh, where the money went and didn't give the order. And then the head of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange came out and said, no, we were in conversations that day. He gave the order. Uh, also, pundits fear perfect storm despite official optimism. Official optimism may have spun this whole thing in Europe and here in the U.S. that we have to have austerity because we're in debt, but then the elephant in the room is the majority of this money is our government's propping up the derivatives. That's why we're in debt. I mean, this is incredible. And we have a photo that I'm going to show to our guests. We'll put it up there now. This came out uh, on different news wires a few days ago and got pulled, but not before we saved it. And that's a shot from one of the Davos, uh, Switzerland uh, conference uh, meetings they were having. Notice it says global governance failure uh, in the background, and, and they were discussing how their system isn't working. The answer is giving the kleptocrats even more power. The Associated Press reports Euro, uh, rich, poor gap, uh, provide key issues at Davos, while the very perpetrators talk about giving themselves $100 trillion more of our money to fix things, and then they'll help the poor. Just amazing. Financial Times of London's reporting, Greek fury at plan for EU budget control. So the rumors are all true now. Germany and others have said, we'll send tax enforcers in to impose the VAT, the rest of it, to pay Greece's debt, which was a bunch of Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan people that signed them onto it. Just, again, off the charts, financial uh, espionage against these countries. And here's Sky Television. Sarkozy announces sales tax rise. So just taxes everywhere globally, cutting the services, raising the taxes to pay the lion's share of it to the very banksters uh, that have implemented this crisis. And talk about an insider whistleblower. I guess for close to a decade, she's been out there exposing them, writing best-selling uh, books. Um, she is Nomi Prinz. Uh, before becoming a journalist, Nomi worked on Wall Street as a managing director at Goldman Sachs and ran the international analytics group of Bear Stearns in London. She is also a senior uh, fellow at uh, Demos, based uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, we'll have her uh, website up on screen for viewers out there. You certainly uh, want to visit it. She, and she has a new novel uh, out that ties into what's happening in reality as well. So she'll tell us about that before she leaves us. Hey, thank you for coming on with us today, Nomi. Thanks a lot, Alex. Well, you heard me rattle through all of that. Uh, uh, what's the latest in the world? What do you think is most important? Well, it's... It's all connected. I, I think at this point, the connectivity between all the things you talked about, the fact that a, a global betting organization like MF Global can make bets relative to Europe, and when they go sour and are going sour, can basically take their customers secured funds to use them to prop up their bets, and then when it all falls apart, can sit in front of Congress, as John Corzine, former head of MF Global, did, and deny, deny, deny. That's one piece. The second piece is what he bet on, which was Europe. And what he basically bet was that at some point, the powers that be in Europe, that's the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB, um, with, as it turned out, the backing of the Federal Reserve, would come in and bail out not the countries, but the banks within the countries who own the government debt of the countries. And if they've got bailout money, they can prop up the government debt that was created to subsidize them to begin with, and then they can go about their merry way, leaving the countries themselves and those local economies in tatters. Now you go on to Greece and people in the streets. Well, in Greece, we've had, well, they've had four rounds of austerity measures. And, and this doesn't get talked about a lot in, well, almost at all in the mainstream news, but people have had 
jobs cut. They have had their hours cut. They have had their pay per hour cut. Um, they've had taxes increased on properties they can't afford. They've, they've already had a lot of austerity, none of which has clearly helped the local economy because it is not their fault. Um, of the of the majority of the population that that what has happened to that country has happened. It is the fault of banks that pilfered the country, a government that tried to stave that off using its own national banks as props, and then those own national banks couldn't contain the damage. Now they've had 110 billion euros worth of bailouts with in return for these austerity measures, also which haven't worked because they don't plug this banking problem. So what we have is this, this continued global mess where in the United States, we've had the Fed fund trillions of dollars, as we've talked about before, in subsidies to the banking system. The banks in return are holding, as we've also talked about, $1.6 trillion of reserves or the money they got back at the Fed for which they're getting interest. The ECB just did the same trick with the push of Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, who was instrumental in the bank bailout here, whereby they extended loans at the end of last year in December to the banks in Europe. The banks in Europe took these loans, cheap loans at 1% interest, and put the money back to the ECB. So now there's $600 billion worth of loans at the ECB. So in total, and I'll stop here, and we'll go on to the next question, there are $2.5 trillion worth of, of money that the banking system, these are the banks that get these loans, have put back onto the books of the Fed and the European Central Bank, doing absolutely nothing to help the populations either in the United States or in Europe that are at their expense. This has all been happening. Well, looking at an example of this here in the United States, uh, we're seeing what they call financial martial law in Michigan, that's what the governor and, and others, as you know, have called it, where they're coming into cities and saying, you don't get to vote, and, and, and we're disbanding your city council, and we're going to hire a corporate company to manage everything and raise rates on people, uh, even though the money has been stolen out the back door, even though global offshoring has destroyed the city. And then I saw another example of one of the uh, biggest towns in Rhode Island, uh, where, the, in their own words, democracy has been suspended. They're getting rid of the city council. A private corporation is now taking control of the town. This is what we see with all these other states. We're now hearing that uh, not just counties and cities, but states going bankrupt. We're now hearing about hundreds of Greek islands that are owned by the people. They're national parks that are also very valuable, being sold and in some cases transferred as collateral, the London Guardian reported, to hedge fund managers who sold them the garbage to begin with and made money on the upside of the bubble. And then on the downside, they get the islands. I mean, it's just incredible. This is like we're a bank robber. The cops show up and give them an award and say, we're going to make you the head of bank security. It's, they <laughs> take the lack of knowledge the public has about finance and they use the corporate bought and paid for media, in some cases, that's gotten government bailout money and it is just a absolute uh, criminal's paradise. I mean, you wrote about this six, seven, eight years ago in 2004, other people's money, the corporate mugging of America. I mean, how bad is this going to get? I mean, I'm basically in my long-winded question and statement, this austerity that we've seen in the third world, now in Europe, it's now coming here. And we see along with it, the internet censorship, the NDAA, everything that goes with it, it's classical tyranny. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's, it, it's all connected, as, as you've just pointed out. The, what's happening in the small towns in the United States, what's happening in the Greek islands, what's happening in, in, in Milan, in, in Italy, they have a lawsuit against uh, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, which is now Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, and a number of others, for basically selling the town a bunch of bad bonds a number of years ago that, that the town had to borrow money or chose to borrow money from the same banks to buy, and now they're stuck with collateral that's worthless, having to pay back these loans, and, and going bankrupt themselves. And this, this has repeated in city after city across the United States and across Europe. And that's the reason that there isn't enough money in local budgets or in state budgets or in national budgets to, to run an economy, because all of the money has been drained out. That was in step one. In step two, in order to repay the money that has, repay the loans that were made against money that has now been drained out, 
these same banks and hedge funds and private equity funds and venture capital firms are looking for collateral. The collateral is what's left. What's left? Yes, they're Greek islands, they're, they're resort hotels, they're um, the electric company infrastructure in small towns in Spain. They are um, the, uh, the wind power organizations and, and, and organization of in, in, in Norway. They, they are, they're all of the pieces of infrastructure that make up an economy that are being used as collateral in the second phase of this whole pillage. And one of the, for example, even the other night when, when all the protesters were, were again arrested outside of Oakland, I was looking up after that because it, it just made me so mad that we're arresting the wrong people all the time, that I looked up what the city of Oakland has done in the past and, and they lost a lot of money investing in uh, securities that, that Goldman and others had basically sold to them through a German company. Um, so, you know, this is, this is in Oakland, but, but they are losing money because of that. Protesters are protesting against this, and they're the ones getting arrested. Um, so it's, it's really a, an increase in a problem because the, the worse it gets, the more the financial institutions want to get back the bets they've already made, and the more they will go after real assets, real, real infrastructure, real, real towns. And this is the next phase of this problem. Well, I think about Austin, Texas, and they say it's about environmentalism. That's just the cover. But I remember five years ago reading about how our power prices would go way up because big multinationals were coming in using government inside uh, uh, regulators to shut down or curtail the city-owned, the county-owned, the co-op-owned power systems, including some that were hydroelectric, shutting them down and, 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 and then coming in and charging two, three, four times what they were previously, well, that's right out of the IMF and World Bank shock doctrine that we've seen in the third world, where you see water prices double or triple in just a few years, power prices, and it wrecks the economy even further. And as you know, the IMF documents that got leaked in 2002 to BBC, they stated, oh, that's even better because once the economy goes into cardiac arrest, we buy up even more. And then it goes into more cardiac arrest so we can buy it for pennies on the dollar. And then it gets even worse, and then we buy it up even cheaper. I mean, this is a scorched earth policy, and you can't call it, I don't call it capitalism. It's worse than even crony capitalism. It is a form of economic warfare. It's, it's it, and, and, and downright stealing. And what happens is the more that these countries are open, and I believe that um, in, not too long from now, three to six months, a year, a lot of the Latin American countries that have had so many problems with debt in the past and had so many structural adjustment programs through the IMF and the World Bank and so forth, at the moment they appear and they are in the research documents of a lot of banks right now, of Goldman, of JP Morgan, and um, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, as the remaining bastions of growth. Right? They are basically telling their clients that the places where there is still money to be made is in these Latin American countries like Peru, like Ecuador, and so forth, even though they, they have many problems of their own because their growth rates haven't been as slashed as they have been in Europe because no one was paying attention to them a few years ago in the write-up to this current depression that we're in. And so my fear is that that's going to be the next step. You're seeing some growth rates that are 6 7 8% in GDP. That's where the money's going to go. And we're just going to have yet another massive fallout that's going to complement the fallout we've seen in the United States and that we're seeing in Europe. Because, it, yes, it, it spirals. The spiral keeps going around and around the world um, and taking over what is left of local infrastructure. And the minute a, a town or a state or, or a nationality can't have control over its own resources and over its own infrastructure, and it's really just on a sort of global roulette table of uh, you know which which bank representing which other bank representing which fund is going to get in there and buy it and restructure it. Um, it's it's a downward spiral, and that's that's what we're in now. We're in a quicker spiral now because there's just no juice in the tank. This is all being run on subsidized funding from from the governments. And so not only has these issues of, of lending, seeing a country go down the tanks, going after their assets happened before, we've seen it before, but now it's being done with far more government subsidization. And so that just makes it a much more dangerous and, and a faster, uh, a quicker unraveling. Of We're showing a video on screen put out by the World Economic Forum. Um, their official site where they talk about failure in global governance. 
and how more global government's the answer. And they always act like it's somebody else's mismanagement that's done this, but it is these very groups that are managing things, but they always seem to spin it when they're the public authors of all this as if giving them more power will fix it and the prostitute media will never call them on it. No, I mean, we were talking right before we went uh, on air here tonight um, about the fact that you were speaking at a conference today for the award-winning film Inside Job that's aired on HBO. And uh, you were discussing the fact that people just now are finally starting to get it. Uh, can you uh, speak to that? Yeah, I was um, I was at a panel over the weekend where Inside Job was was aired, and it's it's an Oscar-winning film by Charles Ferguson. It's it's an amazing way of connecting. It starts off in in Iceland, and it shows how a very solid. Um, and regulated town can basically become prey to international financial predators. And then it sort of goes through ultimately how uh, people are losing jobs in the United States from that and the, the housing crisis and everything else in a very, very clear way. And what it does particularly well is it talks about the, the personal connections um, amongst people, for example, who run Columbia Business School or Harvard Business School with people like Larry Summers, who and became became head over there at Harvard and was also the economic advisor of Obama when all of this bailout money and subsidization of the banking industry was was on full steam um, to Tim Geithner's relationships and and to uh, even uh, Christine Lagarde who is the current IMF chief and in the movie she actually comes off as being uh, pro people in in a way but now she's she's head of the IMF and is trying to extract austerity measures um, which is interesting I pointed that out after the film of course that the film um, had been made before. She, she achieved that position. But, but it really just shows the interconnectivity of these people and literally people walking away from the interviews with Charles Ferguson because they don't want to answer questions. It shows such an angering lack of accountability. And of course, the big guys, Tim Geithner, Hank Paulson, Larry Summers, none of these guys even agreed to be interviewed. So the people who were interviewed were sort of like the second tier people. And even they were getting angry with questions like, well, well don't you think you screwed up? Or, you don't, don't you think that, that what happened was wrong? Aren't you concerned that... Uh, you know, Columbia University is writing papers that talk about how great derivatives are when we know that you know, Warren Buffett is saying that derivatives are weapons of mass destruction and, and getting these non-answers from people. And I just, you know, the, the audience there that night was just wringing their fingers and like, you know, scratching their heads and saying, how, we didn't even know this was going on. Like, how can that be? And, and I said afterwards, you know, I hate to tell you, but it's gotten worse since that film came out, which was only you know, a year and a half ago. Um, since it came out, derivatives, for example, are 20% more in the world um, than they were a year and a half ago. 20% more. That's, that's not just 20%. That is over $100 trillion more of derivative exposure. The top four banks in this country controlled 95% of the derivative exposure of this country, up 20%. So nothing has changed, it's only gotten worse. And people in the audience were just literally like, we had no idea. There were reporters in there that didn't even know the 20% number. They were like, you're kidding me. Like, like we just heard Obama say that all this stuff is contained. And I said, well, you know, for what that's worth. Let me ask you this question, Nomi, and, and people can find out more on your website, nomiprins.com, about all your books and the research and the whistleblowing that you've done from the inside in the last decade or so. I mean, you saw this coming a long, long way away, and I want to briefly talk about what woke you up. But I, I have noticed a different tone from the Davos crowd. I mean, last year they're like, we need $100 trillion more to save you. This year they're saying failure of global governance. George Soros is saying... This is the most dangerous time in the world he's ever seen. Catastrophe. Uh, they seem really freaked out now. So they're starting to get the fact that the world is awakening to them. Hillary Clinton has said they're losing the info war. The public's awake. Zbigniew Brzezinski said the same thing. Uh, I mean, I'm not hyping it when I say I talk to the public. I do a lot of radio interviews myself, TV and stuff. I've never seen people waking up like they are now. So... What do you think we'll see a year from now at the next Davos? How is the world going to change now? And how do you see the establishment trying to curtail this awakening? Because I see it as them hitting the tap out button or the panic switch when they start admitting they want internet censorship. 
Yeah, well, that that's very scary. It's it's internet. It's Twitter. It's you know that that becomes a much scarier way of suppressing information. I think a year from now, I think leading up to a year from now, I think we're going to see more of what we have been seeing all along, but increasing so in Greece. I think we're going to see more people vocally and and physically in streets and sharing information with each other. Um, you know, one thing I, I said the other night when some of the audience said, well, okay, this is all great in theory. You know, you're saying we, we, we shouldn't have derivatives, we should have this, we should have that, but what do we really do? And I'm like, well, what you can do um, is what some people are doing. First of all, you can be here. And second of all, you can tell people what you're hearing. You can listen to sources of information. You can choose what sources you, you wish to agree with or that you believe or that you're connected to. But you have to, um, it's kind of incumbent about a, a, on all of the world's population to continue to spread the message out. And I think with the internet, while it we still have it. It's it, it's a way to get that information out quickly. Look, it's technology that has increased this this degradation of the world economy because it's made trading and derivatives and flowing capital throughout the world so much quicker than ever before, and it will continue to be even more quicker. And it's the banks themselves that that really own the exchanges and own the technology platforms for trading. So all of that has 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 manifested in a in a faster devolution of of the global economy. And I think we need to be equally uh, vigilant of that. That. And I think people are, the more people that know, the more people will know. And I think that we can accelerate that. Uh, you know, you've been talking about it for, for years. I, you know, when I wrote other people's money and, and, and said that credit derivatives, which at the time were like, you know, a half a trillion dollar market, and now they're a $16 trillion market, a part of the larger $700 trillion total derivatives market. And I said, these things are going to be a problem. They're, they're completely vacant of, of transparency and, and support, and they are, they're not safe, and, and nobody listened. I think now at least we're talking about it. Um, which is important. I, I don't think the people in Davos truly understand finance. I, I really, really don't. I think they're scared. I think they're realizing that bailing out bank after bank after bank with all of these trillions of dollars isn't helping economies, but they're still in this mode where they, they're, they're like paralyzed. They don't know what else to do, so they're still pointing to austerity, and that's what's making populations so much more enraged because they know there's nothing more to squeeze from us. Uh, that that's really the issue, and that's when things come to a head. And uh, you know, people who make these decisions at Davos, they they see that they are afraid of that. I don't know. Well, I, I know they have not yet made the leap to understanding what really needs to be done and slapping back these financial institutions as opposed to funding them. But I think at least they see that what they're doing isn't working, and that people are noticing, and that's you know that's positive. That can only um, hopefully spread at this point. Well, every time I research an issue, it always goes back to a handful of brokerage firms and big investment banks. And they have unlimited Ponzi scheme money out of derivatives and the rest of it to where, yeah, they can basically play God and they're incredibly hubris filled. I mean, you worked around these people at the highest levels. You got Corazon making 40 to one bets. I mean, it really shows that, that, that they think they're in control, but they're not in control of themselves. And they're so good at consolidating power that I don't see them getting away with this. Uh, I, mean, I mean, what do you see in your crystal ball? Well, I think they, they definitely feel invincible, and, and they have been invincible. They've, they've been proven to be invincible. Even a John Corzine who's, you know, crashed a company, stolen people's money, can sit there and lie in front of Congress and doesn't feel he's going to be touched and, and may not be touched. But the problem is that there's going to there's gonna be a point at which there simply isn't enough money to plug into this hole. And what the bankers are doing, certainly uh, yeah, the larger ones like Jamie Dimon and so forth, he's trying to contain the problems. He's saying, yeah, Greece may default. I get it. Greece is its own problem. We don't have that much exposure to Greece, yeah, that, that's okay. And he's trying to really segment pieces of this problem off and, and act like they're not part of a larger uh, set of risks that his bank and other banks perpetuate. Um, so I think it's going to take a while before all of those risks kind of start to, to crash the major banks because there's a lot of ego um, and a lot of entitlement, not just running the banks, but but in in the government supporting these banks. You know, in the Treasury Secretary uh, ship of Tim Geithner supporting these banks. So that's gonna that's gonna continue for for a number of years. And the problem is um, that's gonna make the situation worse. But I I do think there will be at least another bank to really tank severely. It's probably gonna be Bank of America. It's deserved to tank now for years. You know, we've talked about it in the past. They're very good at patching up their losses. They've tried to sell off assets 
assets they've owned at rock bottom prices over the years. There's only so much left they can do that with and, and make money to flow, which is why they're trying to find ways to, you know, increase fees on their on their customers. And if one thing doesn't work, go to another thing and so forth. So they still have us as customers, um, us meaning you know, any popular piece of the population that works with banks to, to kind of act as the backstop. But I think there will be another major bank to fail. Um, and I think that this derivatives problem is going to only get bigger. I believe, though, it's going to go through China, go through Latin America before it's like a massive explosion. I think all of this is kind of a slow burn. It's like that little, uh, I don't know what it's called, but the spark plug or something that's attached to the bomb. And, you know, you see it, you see it, it's sort of burning, burning, burning until it gets there. And I, I kind of think we're in that burning state. Is there a, 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 a big explosion point or does it just continue the slow decline? Well, that's what I, I think we're in years of a slow decline. It's interesting. I, I just read a book called Zombie Banks, which uh, is written by a fellow named um, uh, Yonaram on, Onaram, or Yon, Yalman Onaram. Um, and he talks about how, how the sort of governments have been funding these, these zombie banks that really are, are the living dead. They, they basically eat human financial flesh, right? Um, and, and that's what they continue to do. And therefore, it's been a slow burn because it goes from place to place. And, it and because they own the government, and because it's complex, they can right. they can engage like like Japan. Twenty years at the feet yeah. of zombie banks. Right. That that's exactly. Thank you for bringing up Japan. That was that was the other half of my train of thought. Thank you for finishing that. So anyway, he talks about how Japan was that lost decade, and and I'm I'm reading this this chapter about Japan in this book, and I said, you know what, we are halfway. We are five years into this. We are halfway in. You know, a lost decade doesn't really sound so long when we're already talking about the fact that in 2007. Um, you know, Citigroup went to Hank Paulson and said, hey, we have, you know, we have a tremendous problem here. We need government help. And then after that, you know, Bear Stearns imploded, went to J.P. Morgan. We still support that trade. We still support that to the tune of $30 billion of Fed guarantees. All of that started five years ago, and, and we're still nowhere near the end. So we, we could be looking at, you know, a couple lost decades. So that, in answer to your prior question, that's why I see this as a slow burn rather than a complete explosion. But that doesn't, that just makes it slower. It, do, it doesn't make it um, less dangerous. Well, it almost makes it worse because it's a creeping kind of yeah. ambient background death of an economy, not stuff you can see really quick. But even though we're incrementally into this and they're having to admit more and more it's a global depression that you've talked about, not, you know, not just a recession, they're losing so much credibility and people are waking up. I, 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 I mean, how do you see this ending then or what are ways to start reversing this? Well, that's like, I think that wake up thing is, is very important. You know, as, as we, I just mentioned before, it, it's really important. The, the only way you can start to reverse this is to start looking at points of accountability, right? You're not going to get points of accountability from the guys running these banks. You're not going to get points of accountability from the president. You're not going to get points of accountability from the head of the Treasury or the head of the Federal Reserve. It has to sort of come more from the bottom up even if that's the level of attorney generals or, or whatever, or, or local counsel saying, hey, you know, we won't allow ourselves to be taken over and individuals getting in there. I have a friend in Santa Monica who's running for counsel because he just, he's just so appalled by, by what's going on around the country um, and people getting involved in that way because that's really what we have now. And what we, what we have is the ability to connect to each other. And it sounds very sort of, you know, touchy-feely, but it's really true. It's listening to information. It's assessing what's true and what, what makes sense by filtering out the mainstream story that it's all somehow the fault of the economy, you know, some amorphous economy that needs to be slapped back with austerity measures, you know, throughout the world, as opposed to the fact that we were basically used um, by, by very powerful amounts of people and money. And so I think people have to continue to, like, look up that information and, and not be afraid to, to spread the word. I, I really think at this point, that groundswell from the bottom up is, and, and the local up, is, is really what's going to make a change. Because, I, you know, it's not going to come from Washington. Um, it's not going to come from the U.K. Parliament. You know, it's, it's, it's going to come from us. Well, Nomi, okay. um, we've only got a few minutes left here. Uh, NomiPrins.com is the website for people that want to learn more. But looking at this, clearly the establishment knows they've done this. It's been a consolidation plan. They're training the military for domestic operations in Europe, England, the U.S. They now admit it's for the American people. It's for the British people. They now admit they're setting up classical spy systems. Uh, I guess they think that they can rob the whole economy, wreck it, but they don't care. They want to be in charge of it, you know, kind of, uh, you know, king of the garbage pile or whatever. They think they'll get away with it. And now they're trying to sell this idea 
of, oh my gosh, the rich people are exempt from taxes, Warren Buffett and others, but then you go find out they actually wrote the loopholes to be exempt. They just want to raise taxes on the middle class, calling them rich, to get more of that money to transfer it to themselves and banker bailouts and city and county and state investments. And because there is a little bit of uh, you know, nuance and minutia there, again, some of the public's buying into it. A lot of them don't. But I, I mean, I look at Austin, Texas, Formula One, 100 plus million dollars in tax incentives. The city's giving them millions of dollars. This guy's buying his daughter, you, you know, the biggest house in the U.S., gave her $3 billion <laughs> as a gift. And that's great if that's $3 billion he made inventing something. But it's not. You find out all over the world he's basically a gangster. He pays taxes nowhere. And a lot of times the city councils f sell out just so they can get a box and stand there with, you know, their hats on and fancy outfits. They just sell out to be around celebrities. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing how county, city, states, uh, billion dollar sports stadiums uh, for Jerry Jones paid for by the taxpayers. Uh, all, all the big corporations where I live are basically tax exempt, but I've got 30 plus employees. I am, I'm not exempt. I've got the highest taxes you can get because I'm not some guy making 50 million, a billion dollars a year. I mean, it's all targeting real entrepreneurs and nothing is on the backs of these mega rich, and it's so frustrating to them to to then see. I'm uh, I'm ranting because I'm so angry to then see them scapegoat and blame middle class for it. Yeah, well, one of the things, and this is along the lines we were saying that that I read recently is that the IRS is looking to you know expand and crack down. They call it cracking down on on, on tax evaders, and and they're looking at. Um, people who are in the sort of upper level of middle class, which is really nothing compared to any of the, the people that, that you're talking about, um, or, you know, that basically just run small businesses. And, um, Mine was, and employ uh, people and, and, and pay probably for the health care of those people, or at least work it out together. And, and, and it's so expensive to do that. Meanwhile, these same banks, you know, small business loans are at their, their lowest in, in over a decade and so forth. So, so all of it's really um, diminishing the, the capability of, of most people in this country to, to, to get ahead. And again, that's not capitalism. That, that is um, fascism. That, it's fascism. It's cronyism. It's 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 stealing. It's downright pillaging. It's 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 just um, ultimately not healthy for an economy. It's healthy for the people who are entitled. And but it's like you said, it is so conscious. I've seen this for like five years. Every year, articles come out as they cut more and more of the fraud investigators at the IRS and the SEC and all of it. Then you find out the head of these groups are run by Corzine's former deputies, right. and, and they've cut almost all of the corporate crime investigators and people investigating billionaires and even millionaires. And I actually saw headlines last year where they've put the majority of them actually on blue collar people. They're, right. they're not even going after the nouveau riche or somebody making a half million a year now. They're now right. even rotating it down to people that don't even hardly pay any taxes, yes. li literally, so yes. there's no enforcement on the ruling class. I mean, this is conscious government by criminals. What do you call that, a kleptocracy? It, it's a clever. It is government by criminals. It, it is. It is. It's. It's. Um. Bullyism. It's. 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 It, it's. It's federal bullyism because you're basically taking people that. Um. And, and I know what you're talking about. I. I. I have you know truck drivers who write to me and um you know, documentary filmmaker. You know people who who literally work all the time, save their receipts. You know make forty to seventy thousand a year. Have most of that in legitimate expenses in two, three, four year audit procedures. It's. It's ridiculous, and um that's. Uh, it's some combination of stealing and bullying and and, and, and powerism and, and whatever it might be. But thugism. Again, not <laughs> thugism. It is thugism, and it's it's not again healthy for a long term economy. And and what happens is by not connecting the dots on these things, and and they are connectable. You know whether it is taxing um, the wrong people or auditing the wrong people or the ones that really just don't have. Um, anything extra to talk about, have legitimate expenses, and don't really have the time to deal with hiring, you know, fancy audit companies like these banks do to figure out ways around the loopholes they're creating um, to get to the next set of loopholes they can create. And that combines with 
banks being funded by governments with whether it's cheap loans or subsidies to accumulate more banks, whether it's you know private equity or, or investment company CEOs like John Corzine getting a free pass on taking money from his customers, whether it's not really having any regulation on these institutions and saying um, at a State of the Union address, as Obama did last week, that somehow this, this problem is curtailed, that, that regulators used to not be good at their jobs. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but, but now they are. All of this is part of the bigger problem, and, and the bigger problem is that um, there is, a, there is this, a, a powerful group of people that, that, that run things that extract money unfairly, uh, criminally. And who are above the law. And, yes. and that's what's creepy is that they're truly above the law. I mean, Corzine they are. lied to Congress. And so the arrogance, the 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 bravada, the whatever you want to call it, is now going supernova. It is it is a meltdown. And I guess they say pride go before a fall. In closing, uh, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the first month of 2012, tell us about your new novel. Um, well, well, Black Tuesday actually looked at it's it's a historical novel. It's out about a young woman who, who gets involved in in seeing a lot of the fraud that's happening into the 29 crash with with no economic background. You know, just just literally trying to help her family survive. Um, gets involved with the bankers and in, in writing the book, I, I looked at a lot of the historical uh, headlines and things that were happening back at the time leading up to 1929. And you would be just amazed at how many similar things happened then that have happened and reoccurred recently. Um, so. So there's a lot of uh, interesting characters that are based on or that are the real bankers at the time. But but really, it shows the, the book's really about a, a woman who, who finds herself in the middle of it all and, and finds herself having to um, fight back and the struggle in doing that. So um, it was a book close to my heart. I, I hope people like it. It's, it's a way of looking at history without, you know, being bombarded with just the facts and sort of. Uh, getting swept into the story, but 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 seeing the parallels as well at the same time. Well, it's a great book, and it, it's a, it's also a great idea. You've written a bunch of nonfiction books to then write a historical novel, because as you know, sometimes artists, researchers, journalists can tell a story even better in a quasi-fiction, and, and people will listen to it. You know, I use movie analogies a lot on the radio, because that's something that i found people can really click with and understand. Uh, Naomi Prince, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much, Alex. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was an in-depth 40-minute interview. It's, it's, it's hard to talk to that lady for just a few minutes. So much knowledge, and we're all in this together. You know, these tyrants think they can shut down our free speech. They think they can play us off against each other. They think they can use the complexity of finance to expose their fraud. Not anymore. People know the Federal Reserve is private. They know the ECB represents private interest in Europe. And they know that the very criminals that have engineered our economic problems uh, are now posing as our saviors and creating a monopoly uh, out of our pain. It is us or them. And you better use the Internet now while it's still free to a certain extent and use the Internet to fight for its continued freedom uh, because uh, the system's hitting the panic button. They're coming in trying to censor right now because they know that the people are getting organized. They know the alternative media is growing legs and, 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 and really developing. Uh, and they know that the people are getting together across political lines, whether it's the TSA or illegal wars or torture or banksters. And it's not about black or white, old or young. Uh, it's not about Christian, Muslim, you know, Jewish, Hindu, any of this. It's about freedom versus slavery. And humanity is really starting to come together. And that's scaring the ruling elite uh, who've gotten where they are through fraud. And it's going to be their greediness that's going to undo them. They already ran the world. But they had to wreck everybody's lives under them, I guess, just to dominate us. And it's in that pushing too far that they're going to fail. Great job of the crew. Great job to Aaron Dykes with the news earlier. We got a big special report uh, coming up uh, tomorrow uh, evening with uh, Darren McBreen uh, and a lot more. So please join us this evening. And don't forget the free 15-day free trial still running at PrisonPlanet.tv. And also, please don't forget that... Uh, that uh, we're on Roku now. It's gotten explosively popular there. Subscribers can access us on Roku. We're about to be on some other tabletop TV systems. Uh, and we also uh, are going to end that yearly special uh, tomorrow that we run in December and January every year, 44% off a yearly membership at PrisonPlanet.tv. God bless you all. See you back tomorrow night.